Okay. He's going to come out and give us the thumbs up that we're live. We're good? Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and uh, it is always a, a delight to have my friend Jeff Gwynn back with us. So please uh, give him a nice warm welcome. And this is volume three of his cult trilogy, which we'll be, <laughs> we'll be discussing. <laughs> Wonderful book. There's so much to talk about. I have all these ramshackle notes here, which I'll probably ignore most of them. But, um, you know, it's funny, I was, I was kind of going to pose this to the audience. You know, everybody, uh, you know, these, these big events uh, that happen. I remember I was in an anthropology class at ASU when uh, all this was going down, you know, and it was the end of, and I didn't remember that the siege at Waco lasted 51 days. I know it was a long time, but 51 days. And I remember it all kind of went up and that was the talk of the class in anthropology that day. <laughs> and um, just an incredible uh, event. Um, can you tell us, uh, well, briefly, the title is great. David Koresh, The Branch Davidians and a Legacy of Rage. We could just simply organize our chat on these elements. Um, you know, maybe like some of you, I thought, um, and I'll shut up, that David Koresh, uh, was the guy who kind of originated this cult. I thought he was the one who started it up, you know, because of the name Davidian, Brandt, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I learned a lot about the background of this of the Davidians. And can you talk a little bit about, about the origins of, uh, of the group? Sure. I think one of the problems with a lot of narrative nonfiction about an iconic event is that uh, the writers get kind of hung up and always talking about what happened, which is important, but they never explain how it happened and, and why it happened. To understand that, you have to go back, where did these people come from? Because history doesn't happen in a vacuum. Everything is related. I did not know much of anything about the Branch Davidian history when I started this, and I had assumed, as, as I think you had, that this was something recent. I didn't realize their religious roots go back to the 1840s in America, that uh, in more modern times, Koresh and most of those who came to join him uh, were poached from the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the reason they broke away from the Adventists is they felt that a couple things were about to happen. The Adventists, as any of you know who are familiar with the church, well, a couple tenets that they have is that first, uh, when the end of days comes, Jesus is going to judge us all, and only a small select number of people will be gathered up by him to come back for the thousand-year kingdom of God. So you have to really mind your biblical P's and Q's in terms of what you are instructed to do and not do. 144,000, that was it, right? Right, and everybody else, you know. And the second is that God occasionally, not often, but occasionally, sends messages through a human prophet. You're not talking about somebody showing up every other week, the new prophet, but occasionally it will happen. The what ultimately became the Branch Davidians was started by uh, a fella in Los Angeles in the late 1920s, early 1930s, who thought the Adventists weren't being strict enough. You really had to, to straighten out. He thought the Adventists were too worldly. And ultimately, he uh, had a few followers. He bought some cheap land in Waco, Texas, which is sort of called the belt buckle of the South and then proceeded with his new holy mission, which was to talk all the other Seventh-day Adventists into becoming more disciplined so they could be saved. There were several prophets who led the Branch Davidians in Waco. Uh, the one before David Koresh was named Lois Roden. 
and you got to be the leader by representing some new light, some new bit of knowledge from the Bible that God has helped you interpret differently. Lois's was that the Holy Ghost is female as well as male. So that means God values women as much as men, and that's hard to argue about, but that was what Lois said that God had taught her. Vernon Wayne Howell shows up age 21 at Mount Carmel. He's literally incoherent. He, stud he stutters a lot. He can't complete a thought. And yet somehow he becomes Lois's disciple. As Lois wanes, she had breast cancer. Vernon, her protege, suddenly has new light to share that he's been taken up to heaven. And Angel Zarev informed him of a couple things. Number one, he is the new iteration of Old Testament King Cyrus, who did some wonderful things for the Jews thousands of years ago. And so Vernon must change his name to Koresh because that is how the name Cyrus is pronounced in Hebrew. Second, he must become the lamb of the book of Revelation. Anybody here often pour over the book of Revelation? and You've read it, right? On um, the bedside table. Well, for the branch to get it was. Yes. Um, Vernon said, now Koresh, and he took the name David because when Christ comes back after the end of days, he'll sit on the throne of David. So that's how we get David Koresh that he would be the one to open the seven seals in the great book of Revelation, described in Revelation. As he opened each seal, more events would occur until the final seals were open, chaos descended on the earth, and then Jesus would come back to judge who was fit to carry on in, in the new thousand year kingdom of God. The third thing, and this is where it got pretty critical, he no longer said that the end of days is coming. Instead, he, the Lamb, and his followers would make it come. They would go do battle with the agents of Babylon. And he meant uh, the United States government in that. The Lamb and some of his followers would be killed. It would have to be a life and death struggle. But their souls would lie under an altar for a little while. And then God would translate them back up. And the Lamb and his followers would lead the armies of Christ. They would come back and they would defeat Babylon. And the Lamb would help not rule the earth. That was God's job. But he would certainly be one of the leaders in, in the, new, the new world to come. So that's how they got there. But it was a process that took years and years. And I didn't think we could tell the story of Mount Carmel without folks really understanding that. May I add one other thing? Please. <laughs> He's the boss. If he tells me, that's it. One of the things that's happened in all these years since is there's an awful lot of people who mock the Branch Davidians or have very little respect for them. How could they be so stupid? Well, the fact remains, they're biblical literalists, and there are quite a few of those folks in America today. And everything they did in their lives, from the clothes they wore, to the food they ate, to the way they talked to people, was all based on the Bible and what their leader, Koresh the Lamb, taught them. When I interviewed one of the survivors who'd been in Mount Carmel, her name's Kathy Schroeder. She had four young sons at Mount Carmel, ranging in age, I think, from about nine down to an infant. And one of the middle kids went out to play lawn around Mount Carmel. Now, when I say lawn, we're talking about scrubby, fire ant infested ground. And he found a grasshopper. I just poke it at it as kids will, and the grasshopper was killed. He took the dead grasshopper in to show his mother. She made him eat it. And the reason she did was it teaches in Leviticus, in the Bible, that the only reason to kill any living thing 
is because you're going to consume it. Therefore, because she valued her child and his soul, he had to eat it, otherwise he would be insulting God. So anyway, that's who But she didn't call him grasshopper after that, did she? Well, you know, that's, <laughs> there's so many jokes people make, and yet what we are doing is these are folks who truly believe they were doing what yeah. God told them to do. Right. They were doing it to save the world, to start a new thing, not to end it. And whatever else we may think of the decisions they made or the value of what they believe, the fact is they did believe it. And that's half the reason all this tragedy occurred. Sorry. No. Um, Long answer. I made a joke, but um, you know, I wanted to ask you, uh, some, of these, some of these cult leaders, they share a lot of different, seem to share a lot of different personality traits. But the, the, the question I wanted to ask you was, after researching this, is your view of David Koresh, uh, was he a charlatan, you know, the classical charlatan? Or was he a, a, a fanat, kind of a true believer to the end? Or both? Well, you it's know, a both. Yeah, well, I've written 25 books. Three of them, Manson, Road to Jonestown, and this book, are about groups that are just tossed into a catch-all category called cults. And the general opinion being that these are people who aren't too bright, apparently, because they follow such obvious frauds. And Manson and Jim Jones and David Koresh do have something in common. Each of them said in attracting followers that there are these great evils out there, and I am the only one who can fix it. Sounds familiar. Well, see, that's the thing. Um, Politicians or demagogues saying that, you know, vote, if you vote for my opponent, the world's going to hell, right? right? Uh, a lot of us uh, who are churchgoers, you know, you occasionally get the minister in a mainstream church saying this is what you got to do. If you don't, you know, you're supporting God. Also a difference. Charlie Manson was a con man. He had no belief in anything other than himself, and he only had the ability to attract and keep as followers a couple dozen drug-addled kids. He was, in, in, in of himself, he's insignificant. There were some murders that caught the world's attention, but Charlie, forget him. Jim Jones did not believe in God. He said he did for a while to bring people into his church, but the purpose of bringing them in was to get a group that could bring about social change. He wanted racial equality. He wanted financial equality. He wanted gender equality. And until hubris and drugs overtook him, he and his followers actually accomplished some worthwhile things. But when any leader begins to project himself as more than a human being, who can be as fallible as anybody else, that's when you're heading for trouble. David Koresh, though in the book I write that he plagiarized all his major prophecies from an earlier man who decided he was Koresh and the Lamb and who would open the seven seals and everything else. And if any of you are surprised by that, I'm not going to tell any more details because you might think then you didn't need to read the book. But Cy was that Cyrus Teed? Yep. Old Cyrus T. His picture's in the Great book. name, by the way. But as near as I can tell, and you, you know, I've spent about 12 years of my life on these three books. Koresh convinced himself how, why, that he was all these things he claimed to be, and that all these things he's prophesizing are going to happen. And then there's this one other crucial difference. And again, I do not agree with David Koresh. I don't sympathize with him. And the things that happened because of him were catastrophic and they shouldn't have happened. But I know I am in contact with some former members of the Manson family. I actually became friends with some survivors from Jonestown 
And the former members of the Manson family, the Jonestown survivors, are unanimous in something now all these years later. How could I have been so stupid? How could I get taken in? I feel so terrible that I was fooled. Every surviving Branch Davidian I have spoken with across the country and over a period of years still believes David Koresh was the Lamb of Revelation, that everything that happened at Mount Carmel is part of the prophecies being fulfilled and he would be back. They still love him and they are still completely convinced that he loved them. And whether we agree with them or Koresh or not, it's incredible that bond lasted 30 years, don't you think? Yeah. Um, let's see, what was I going to say here? Just getting back a little bit to um, uh, the period when um, Ms. Roden, her name, first name escapes me, Lois. Lois. Yeah. Okay, so her, the, kind of the end of her reign, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because uh, David Koresh um, goes with her, I think, to, to Israel. Is that right? His first trip there was with her. Right. Coming along as sort of a student. Yep. And so can you talk a little bit about how, you know, the transition from the student to ultimately the leader and George, her sure. son? And um, Lois Roden, leader of the Branch Davidians, took Vernon Wayne Howe as, as her protege. Uh, surviving Branch Davidians who were there when Vernon arrived all agree no one could understand why she was spending so much time with this loser. Basically, when he did talk coherently, it was only on one of two subjects, either how he was going to be a rock star someday, or forgive me for saying this, but it's a fact, that he masturbated too much and wished he could get that under control. That was basically Vernon. Yet she would take him with her on her various trips, and including to Israel. She gave him special study sessions, special to the point where Lois in her 60s and Vernon in his very early 20s became lovers in hope that a biblical passage that the prophetess shall bear a child would be fulfilled. It wasn't, but they went on. And gradually the other Branch Davidians saw a change in Vernon, and then particularly after he became David Koresh, that suddenly he was speaking co not only coherently, but cogently. She would invite him to teach a little himself, and he would talk about the Bible in a way none of them, and remember these people have spent their lives pouring over the Bible, had ever thought about before. He would say there's this connection between this chapter in the Old Testament and then this chapter in the New Testament. Everything is interrelated now. Let's study this. Maybe it's a passage that involves a white horse. Then he would say, now where else in the Bible do we see a white horse? Well, it's, well, it's in this chapter. So the message we should be getting from the first chapter, how can we connect it to the one here? And these folks, mostly were astounded. Lois had a son named George. George, in the opinion of the district attorney in McLennan County at the time, Vic Fizell, was nuts. And he felt it was his right to succeed his mother. There was actually a gun battle at Mount Carmel between George and Koresh, who'd come on the property to uh, try to reestablish himself, in which George had his gun hit by, uh, by some, a bullet from the other side, and Vernon and his seven followers who were there were arrested for attempted murder and were tried for that. Jury didn't convict him. Everybody in Waco knew George was nutty. And this was, uh, this was in the late 80s, right? Mm -hmm. A few years before. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, just for what it's worth, George ended up in an asylum because he had tried to kill somebody with his bare hands who had disagreed with him and eventually died of a heart attack. Not long after Mount Carmel, but if you study some of the old clippings, journalists found out the, you know, the funny farm, whatever you want to call it, where George was staying. 
and they ran out to interview him during the siege because they didn't have anything else to write about. So George Boothley got famous too. He was an odd man. But Vernon Howe David Koresh, he evolves into, if you listen to his tapes, if, if you talk to the people who listen to him, an amazingly magnetic preacher. He didn't have a great vocabulary, but his heart seemed to be so into it that he could teach for hours and people would listen. Uh, if you feel like it sometime on the internet, some of those sermons are right there. I would invite you, if you're curious, to listen a little bit. You, you might find that you're going, huh. I, I've had to listen to a couple hundred hours of the tapes, and every once in a while he'll say something, and I'll just go, wait a minute. So, okay, so he goes to L.A. briefly. Yeah. And then comes back to the Ant Hill. And, That's um, what they, the Branch Davidians called Mount Carmel, the Ant Hill, because it was so infested with ants. Right. And there's so much I want to get in. I know we don't have that much time, but can you talk about sort of the, that period when he comes back and, um, and, and the, how the compound is created? Sure. Uh, Mount Carmel originally, on this desolate hill, has a number of little shacks built on the grounds where the followers live. When Verdon decided that the big thing was coming down, uh, those shacks were torn down and the scrap wood was used to build this huge sort of monolithic building, Mount Carmel, with only enough electricity to power a window unit in Vernon's bedroom, uh, running water only in the kitchen. Uh, the women and children used slop buckets inside and the men had a very primitive latrine outside. It was, it was terrible to live in. I mean, when it was cold, the wind was whistling, the walls couldn't protect you. When it was hot in the summer, and I promise you folks, you know, I know it gets hot here, but in Waco it's humid besides. Uh, they had a couple little fans that plugged into the few outlets that, that you know, that did get into the room. It was a hard place to live, which is what Vernon intended, David Koresh intended, because you had to prove you were sacrificing comfort. God would be watching. Everything you did was going to be judged. They needed money to live there. Some of them had outside jobs. Hal's 14-year-old wife, Koresh's 14-year-old wife, was a checker in a local supermarket. They had a postman. They actually had a Harvard graduate lawyer who practiced law from a little office in the corner of Mount Carmel. But to earn more money, first they opened a garage. Then they started selling hunting gear, vests. The women at Mount Carmel would sew in extra pockets, you know, so you could have lots of ammunition to go slaughter God's innocent creatures. <laughs> and he went to gun shows. And, yes, and yeah. then they got the bright idea, mid-1992, uh, presidential campaigns were going on. And the word was out from the NRA, if a Democrat's elected president, they're going to outlaw the sale of automatic weapons. So David and a gun dealer in Waco got a great idea. What we'll do, you can take a semi-automatic gun, which means if you pull the trigger, only one bullet or a very short burst will fire. And if you get a, a special part called a lower receiver, and you know how to install that in the gun, it becomes an automatic weapon. And pull, you, know, you pull the trigger, the bullets spew out. The idea was we could sell, they could sell these things at gun shows, and then if a Democrat got elected, the people would be so desperate who wanted to own automatic weapons that they'd quick buy some so that maybe the government would grandfather the automatic weapons owned by people. Two problems with that. First, if you do that legally, you must register them. You must file paperwork so the government knows where these automatic weapons are. And secondly, you must pay a tax on the weapons. The Branch Davidians did neither one. When Vernon announced some new lights from God, specifically that God wanted him to have multiple wives, so every woman at the compound was now his wife, 
And all the men in the compound had to give up sex completely because that would allow them to better concentrate on obeying God. Some left in anger. And the word got around about this stockpile of guns. And Vernon is not only stockpiling guns, David, but he's actually teaching his followers how to use them because the battle is now going to come anytime. And to please God, they really have to put up a fight. I mean, if they get killed just kind of standing there, that doesn't follow through on what Revelation is demanding. That's the fifth seal, right? ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, gets wind that this is going on. They don't care then or the participating agents to this day, pretty much, do not care what the Branch Davidians believed. Didn't matter to them that to the Branch Davidian secular law meant nothing if the Lamb is telling them God says this is what you need to do. So they didn't study that. All they cared about, well, here's a bunch of religious nuts who've got illegal, dangerous weapons, and the people who have left them, our sources, are saying, well, they're preparing to fight Babylon, and they think that's America at any time. Now these people might take these guns, charge out of Mount Carmel, and start mowing down innocent citizens, or they might pull a Jonestown and all kill themselves. And so the ATF determined we're going to have to do something. We are going to have to get in there, separate them from the guns, arrest this guy Koresh, and go from there. What they were doing, though they didn't realize it, absolutely fitting the pattern that Koresh had promised, that Babylon will attack us and we must fight back. They were bringing an apocalypse to an apocalyptic community. How many were there at the moment? Uh, there were about 140 people in Mount Carmel at the time of the raid, but that counts small children. And there were about three dozen kids. And weren't they, no, I was just gonna, just gonna ask about CPS. And wasn't it CPS that first kind of mm -hmm. uh, started investigating? Uh, Child Protective Services had heard rumors that small children were being beaten viciously at Mount Carmel. They were right and they were wrong. Uh, babies as young as six months old were being paddled on the buttocks for doing things wrong. And children who transgressed, they, they had their rear ends pounded with wooden spoons. There was also rumors, which were true, though they couldn't yet be proven, that David Koresh was having sex with underage girls. At this point, he had multiple wives, some as young as 13. And there's actual records of him having sexual contact with little girls as young as 10. They couldn't prove that. When they had interviews with the parents and the kids from Mount Carmel, they just spewed what Koresh spewed, you know, well, we're following the Bible, spare the rod, you know, all our children are happy. And I've interviewed adults who were kids in Mount Carmel. And they, even if they don't believe in Koresh anymore, say things were pretty idealistic. And if they, there was corporal punishment, uh, it was done with an attitude of love. But you've got these things that are rumored. The ATF has no jurisdiction over children being beaten or little girls being raped. But it still gave them extra incentive. Not only are we going to go in there and get those guns, which are illegal, and they are illegal. It's ATF's sworn oath to go in and stop that kind of thing. But they also felt they would be rescuing children in danger of being beaten to death and saving young girls from getting raped. In every way, they believed there was no choice but to intervene. Not knowing, not understanding in the slightest, that the Branch Davidians would not only be waiting for this, but would welcome it. It would be their reward from God to die at the hands of Babylon. Yes, sir. In this apocalyptic thing, was Koresh self-aware enough to use and or build his philosophy on what happened at Ruby Ridge? 
Uh, if you don't know about Ruby Ridge, uh, in October of 92, ATF and the FBI were involved in a shootout with some individuals who were believed to be militant. One of them had been uh, arrested for selling an illegal gun to an ATF agent, but he had sort of jumped bail, hadn't gone back in for his hearing. There was some shooting. Uh, a child was killed. The wife of the uh, suspect was killed. His name was Randy Weaver. And it was all on the news, and it appeared that here you have this overwhelming force of federal agents, and they killed a child. They killed a mother who, uh, at least the people inside the building that was being besieged, said was holding her baby at the time. Weaver did go to prison briefly for violating his parole, but he and his surviving children sued the government and won a $3 million settlement. ATF saw this, what was going to happen at Mount Carmel, as a way to sort of redeem themselves in public opinion. They were going to film the whole thing, show we can go in there with this dangerous group of religious crazies. Nobody's going to get hurt. And when we come to our budget hearings in Congress on March 10th, look at what we can do, that you're getting your money's worth. Agents who went in there that day deliberately had guns of low caliber, so if there was any shooting, the bullets wouldn't penetrate the flimsy walls and maybe hit a child in another room. They brought candy in their pockets so that when they did go in, the little Branch Davidian kids wouldn't be scared. They'd be comforted. And they had arranged for certificates for Happy Meals for all the kids from McDonald's later that day. <laughs> and again, this is all true. I mean, I've seen all the paperwork. Nobody on their side intended anything bad. And for those who believe, and there are many who do, that the Branch Davidians were innocent victims, we must remember this. For the ATF and then the FBI, none of the, their agendas did not involve anybody dying at all. What they needed to do and desperately wanted to do was get everybody out alive, no casualties to show it could be done. Only the Branch Davidian agenda involved people having to die in a firefight. And so what, what ensued was, I mean, there's really no other word for it but clusterfuck. I mean, not to use profanity, but uh, it, it really describes it well. Uh, I mean, the, as you say, the ATF, they were outgunned, completely outgunned. They had no real strategic advantage. Uh, there was no cover. Um, as we get into... Uh, as we get into the siege, and I don't want to go over everything because then you won't want to read the book, which is well, really wonderful. It's 51 days, and you guys probably have something to do over the weekend. <laughs> Can you talk about the role of, uh, since we have investigative journalists here? Um, By the way, Robert Anglin is one of the most brilliant journalists operating in America today. <laughs> Who is going to write a book, right? He better. Yeah. Well, talk about the role of journalists in this story. Very important. The media knew this was an important thing happening. The firefight on February 28th with ATF in and of itself, four agents die, six branch Davidians. It's newsworthy. Then the FBI sets up a siege, which goes on and on and on. And the nation is fascinated. Remember, this is the first time with CNN that there was actually live broadcasts available 24-7. And not just American newspapers, but reporters from all over the world descend on Waco. And it's tough for Waco when Waco's descended on because it's not built for this kind of thing. And every day there would be a press conference. The FBI and ATF would have nothing to say, same as yesterday. The journalists who have stories to file, they've got editors waiting, you know, and get us something good that nobody else has. Try going out in the community, Waco citizens. How do you feel about these dangerous Branch Davidians living among you? They're not dangerous, you know, they're weird. <laughs> but hell, I get my, my car fixed at their garage, or I know David Koresh's wife, she's checker 
you know, at the grocery store. And so the journalists couldn't get that. I mean, how many times can you write, these local people don't seem afraid. But how many times with your editors of the world watching can you say, well, nothing changed? So the press conferences, FBI would say, cult, cult, cult. They would uh, mention Manson and the Manson family, Jim Jones and People's Temple. So there's all this pressure. The FBI begins to feel we have to do something. There is no attorney general yet. They, they're part of the, the uh, Oh, geez, can't remember the Department of Law and Order. Um, anyway, they have to report Attorney General's top of the list. And there is none. Janet Reno's not sworn in yet. But they begin getting this idea. And uh, a very brave FBI agent analyst who was there for the whole thing speaks on the record, and he has the records to prove it because he was the scribe who had to write everything down. Uh, after a couple of weeks, they start talking among themselves, we can use gas to get them out of that building. And they start studying CS gas, and the, the idea being, if we insert it gradually over a couple of days, it won't really harm anybody, but their eyes will itch and run, you know, and they'll, their skin will be irritated, and they'll come out. They don't want to shoot out. They've got tanks at this point. The ATF didn't have enough firepower. But if the Branch Davidians are going to have automatic weapons, then good. Here's a tank pointing right at you. Go ahead and shoot now, buddy. But the pressure was on them, and they needed to do something, they felt. And so, after seven weeks, they put together a plan, an operational plan. And they write it up, and Reno gets sworn in, and they promise her we're going to insert the gas over a couple days. And there's all these studies that as long as it's gradual, this gas is not going to have permanent negative effect on anybody, even little children. And it's true. They weren't making that up. Unless how, it goes boom. How, well, <laughs> however, does your next question uh, get to the however? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, do you want to continue with that thread, or shall we, uh, shall we back up a little bit and if talk you about? Want. Yeah, you're, you're the boss. You tell well, me. I don't want to get to the final boom um, <laughs> quite yet because okay. there's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, what about what about Koresh's early on his interaction with the media? You know, he's uh, on the phone. There's even some video footage that's aired, mm -hmm. um, and then at some point the FBI cuts the. Electricity. And takes control, mm. thus alienating the media. Uh, and then there's the whole sinful messiah series that starts to come out. The thing about David Koresh is people assume because he was a high school dropout, because he was kind of a Bible babbler, in fact, the FBI called his exhortations to them over the phone to learn what he believed in. They called it Bible babble. But he was street smart in that he understood what an opportunity this is with the world media right there, hanging on every word. And what he hoped would happen, and this is a sign that he really did believe what, what he was saying, is that he would get an opportunity at some point to preach to the world through the media that was there about the seven seals and all the things you have to do so you survive the end times. And quite frankly, this was someone who from the time he was a child wanted to be important. He sure wanted to be famous, you know, wanted to be a rock star. And the media certainly would have cooperated, except the FBI isn't letting him deal with the media directly. The only phone line in Mount Carmel goes directly to FBI negotiators. And the Branch Davidians are reduced to writing slogans on sheets and hanging them out the windows at Mount Carmel. And what is going to happen here is that at some point, Koresh, because you got to remember, his followers are in there with him. He's been promising God is going to honor us. And I think most of them, from what I understand from talking to them, thought that, okay, when we go into battle with everybody in Babylon and there's shooting, 
Yeah, we may die, but it doesn't mean that we're going to have to physically be in pain. We're going to be translated up into heaven. Well, some of them are wounded. They've had seven, eight weeks of having to live on MREs, meals ready to eat from the military, and uh, they, they'd stockpiled these before the siege started, and the water supply rapidly was running out. They're uncomfortable, they're scared. They've seen some of their fellow Branch Davidians die, not gloriously being lifted up into heaven, but being blown apart by bullets during the initial raid and screaming in agony and asking to be put out of their misery. At some point, they're going to get tired of waiting. The lamb said, this is going to happen, it's happening, we got to get it over with. David Koresh has a sense of theater. He has to have some sense that, you know, we're wearing out the message that we can deliver and have people pay attention. And so he makes an offer to the FBI through his attorney, Dick DeGuerin, one of the great defense attorneys of our time, uh, who actually tells Koresh, you know, I can get you off on murder charges for the four agents who died. You know, they came with guns to where you lived, you were scared, you defended yourself. I asked DeGuerin, okay, you told him that. Did you also tell him you could get him off for the charges of statutory rape that would be coming? And DeGuerin laughed and said, no, someone else would have to defend him for that. So Koresh offers his deal. God has spoken to me. And what I will do is I will write an explanation of each of the seven seals, in, in, in effect, opening each of them. And this is going to be the most important religious document ever. And if you will wait while I write these things, and he thought it might take a day or two for each of the seven seals, and then distribute what he wrote to religious scholars around the country who could talk about it. Then we promise we will come out. And so when the FBI is getting really antsy and getting ready to put in CS gas or do whatever they have to do, it seems like there's a way it's maybe could end decently after all. Except for one thing. The FBI lead agents did not trust David Koresh. They thought he was a complete charlatan and that he was lying about everything he had said all during the siege. And he must be lying about this again, that this was just one more trick to drag it out. And hadn't he made a, a, a promise before that to... Uh... Almost at the beginning of the siege, yeah. March 2nd, he had told the FBI, if you let me make a tape of what we believe and you broadcast it nationally, we'll come out. And he made the tape. And it was broadcast nationally by the Christian Broadcasting Network. And then when the FBI saying, okay, everybody out now, you know, two things happened. Number one, they didn't know that for the Branch Davidians themselves, they saw this as the moment when the, those of them who had survived the original raid would be translated by God. They're coming out with their wounded, with their little children, and they've got hand grenades, and they are going to basically blow themselves up. They do not consider this suicide. People in Jonestown committed suicide. What they are doing is taking the next step that the Lamb and the Book of Revelation promise. They're going to translate up to heaven. If some agents on the ground die in the process, well, okay, that's fine. But just as they're getting ready to go out and do this, and I've talked to the survivors, they really believe that's what was going to happen. They were going to walk out and pull the pins and everybody was going to get translated. Koresh tells them to stop. God has told him he doesn't want them coming out yet. The FBI, when they hear 
over the phone from Koresh. Well, well actually, Steve Schneider, Koresh is number two. God spoke to David and said, we can't come out yet. To them, this was an absolute lie. This was it. It's reneging. To Koresh's followers, it's, well, even if David promised we'd do this, when God says you can't, you got to stop. Did David Koresh really believe he had a message from God? Or did David Koresh decide maybe he didn't want to go blow himself up with a hand grenade that day? We will never know. But now he's making this promise seven weeks later, and the FBI guy's in charge. You know, uh-uh. They're just, you know, we're going to give him the time to write it, and then he's just going to say again, God told us, don't come out. And so they decide they must bring this to a close. And the way to bring it to a close is to gradually insert CS gas into Mount Carmel over the period of a couple days. Does that mean if I'm missing following the same FBI agents who actually thought this was old? Those agents who were mostly negotiators who thought they should wait were taken off the case and sent home. <laughs> by, by this time, pretty much everybody left on the ground in the FBI, we, we got to do something, let's do it. Enough. And so, you know, to, to kind of follow up on this, I mean, everything goes boom. We watched it on TV. Um, everybody saw it. And uh, so in the book, you talk about, you know, a couple of different theories about the fire mm -hmm. and how it started. Am I spoiling things by listing these? No. List away. And no. this is true. There's four possible reasons it happened. Well, the first one, the FBI said it intentionally, rule one. Um, second is, uh, I think it was an accident, you know. They had space heaters, Coleman lanterns, lit with oil. I have, th the third The third one is the, the Davidians said it themselves, which seems plausible. Right. And then I forget the fourth one. No, the fourth one, the third one is that the Davidians set everything on fire to commit suicide. Hasten the process. Right, and the fourth one, is that the Davidians set the fires, but they believe based on the Bible because there's several instances where God uses fire as a wall between the true believers and Babylon, and the fire protects the true believers. They're, they're not incinerated. Those are the four possibilities. But the one thing that was definite that happened was the FBI, Byron Sage, who was uh, one of the leaders there, talked to me about this before he passed away uh, from cancer a couple months ago. He said, we had plan A and plan B. Plan A was we were gonna insert the gas gradually, but plan B was if anybody in that building fired at the tanks inserting the gas or the agents that are out here, we were just putting it all in there and getting them out. Now, the surviving Branch Davidians all swear they never fired a shot that morning. Nothing. The FBI, in its logs, all say bullets were flying out of Mount Carmel at us. But what happened was the FBI basically tossed in what was supposed to be 48 hours worth of gas in three and a half hours and huge flammable clouds of CS gas are wafting down the hallways at Mount Carmel. And the people who were in there and survived talk about how it just all of a sudden, you couldn't see, your skin is just, and yet, for a couple hours, they're enduring it until just before noon, all of a sudden, Mount Carmel goes up in flames. Uh, later, and again, the agent who was on the record in the book was part of the crew that had to go in to look afterwards. They estimated it reached 3,000 degrees inside. 76 Branch Davidians in there literally boiled and burned to death, including children. Nine escaped. One, Clive Doyle, when I interviewed him, he's in his 80, he was in his 80s, showed me his hands, which were scarred in a way that I never had seen before. 
It was so hot in there that the skin on his hands was bubbling from the heat. And so we have a situation where this is how it ends. And conspiracy theorists ever since have gone to town on it. It didn't end in Waco. Mount Carmel may have burned, but the story is still impacting us in very specific ways. Which are? Thank you. <laughs> as soon as the siege was over, there began to be in America, particularly rural America, the formation of armed citizen militias whose stated purpose was, we need to be ready if the government comes with its guns and the tanks to attack us. Timothy McVeigh, and there's a picture of him in the book, uh, had come to Mount Carmel with a lot of protesters and actually sat on the hood of his truck and sold anti-government bumper stickers. But two years to the day after Mount Carmel burned, Timothy McVeigh blew up a federal building in Oklahoma City and said it was in retaliation for Mount Carmel. About four years after that, every April 19th, surviving Branch Davidians would have a memorial service in Waco. Clive Doyle, one of the survivors, would be moderator, and different Branch Davidians would speak, mostly about how everything David said came true. We were not hurting anyone. And this is their perspective. Our religious freedom was just ignored, and these people came in to kill us, and they couldn't kill all of us, you know, on February 28th, so they killed the rest of us on April 19th. And people who sympathized would come to Waco. There sometimes would be at least 500 people, you know, outside there. But on this particular day, Clive Doyle was talking on the microphone, and a burly man kind of shoved him out of the way and grabbed the microphone. And he announced that if there was ever another situation that could be like Mount Carmel, with government agents coming to kill innocent citizens, if he and his friends could get there first, it would never happen again. And he was doing some sort of primitive internet broadcasts from out of his garage in Austin, Texas, and his name was Alex Jones. As the militia movements grew and the internet proliferated, they would have their websites. And on these websites constantly would be, because of Mount Carmel, we need to be doing this. And it follows all the way through December, uh, January 6, 2021. Many of the people that we see being imprisoned for treason and felonious assault, uh, particularly leaders of the Oath Keepers, they all have said through the years that their incentive for this was Mount Carmel, that we've got to prevent this. A lot of us, I think, I'm willing to bet everyone in this room is troubled by the general atmosphere in our country today, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, whether you're MAGA, whether you're liberal. It's not, none of us can feel safe right now. And it goes back to Mount Carmel being ground zero. This is why I think it's important to understand what happened at Mount Carmel, particularly the fact that we had two potentially violent groups and neither side bothered to think of what the other one was doing and why they were doing it. It was simply decided that because they don't believe what we believe, they're not doing what we think they should do, they're the bad guys. There are no heroes, there are no good guys, there are no bad guys. There's no conspiracy. There were human errors of judgment, terrible ones. But what really could have stopped this was ATF understanding what the Branch Davidians believed, that a raid was absolutely the wrong thing to do, but they didn't care. The Branch Davidians had money. During the siege, when David Deguerin 
agreed to represent David Koresh and went in there. Koresh said he had about $40,000 in cash he could give to Garen right there. They could have filed the paperwork. They could have paid the taxes. They were breaking the law. Until we understand how refusing to consider the perspective of the other side can only end in terrible confrontation, it's going to keep happening. Because we have been able to find a lot of new things about Waco, particularly from the ATF agents who were forbidden ever to talk about it, who are talking for the first time in this book. If we understand how and why that happened, then maybe we can understand how and why to deal with some of the seemingly insurmountable tensions we've got today. And they had their opportunity, didn't they? I mean, there, there were biblical scholars that came in before all this went down and said, hey, wait a minute, guys. Some of the finest biblical scholars in America when they heard what Koresh had broadcast initially, picked up on the clues. If he's talking about now we're in the seventh seal yeah. because we've been attacked. And, they, and some of these folks went to Waco to the FBI and asked for the chance to explain this. We can tell you about some things that will help you do that. The FBI wouldn't talk to them. They were all tired, exhausted, yeah. and... None of this, and that's what frustrates me most. I have spent three years. This didn't have to happen. It was not because of some evil plot. It was not because the government went in determined to kill people or that the Branch Davidians, at least at that time, were considering taking their guns and coming out and killing innocent civilians. All it would have taken would be for people to just think about why is the other side drawing the line here. It could have been prevented. I hope to hell, in whatever years I've got left as a, as a writer about American history, we never have another Mount Carmel that I have to write about. Awesome, let's open it up to questions. Uh, may I just point out, I am on a national book tour, and this is going out live. It is, so yeah, everybody people, watching, yeah, please ask questions. People in places I'm going to be going to will say, did the crowd at the Poison Pen ask better questions than me? <laughs> yes, yeah. ma'am, you had a question. If it would be years, if there were dead bodies, has there been any research done on how the Mm -hmm. Can you repeat? That? There has been. Uh, why people followed David Koresh. You will see in the book, I can't say any number of survivors because there weren't that many, and they're getting older and they're starting to die off. But every one of them said the same thing about David Koresh's Bible studies, that when he talked about obscure parts of the Bible, parts of the Bible that are almost impossible to understand. And I've read the book of Revelation now a couple hundred times, and I still just go, huh. <laughs> that he could make it clear. Suddenly, they could understand things in the Bible they had never understood before. He was that charismatic. He told them the things they were desperate to understand and did it so well that 30 years later, they still believe in him. So we're not talking stupid people, but we are talking people with a certain mindset who wanted to understand things in the Bible that they weren't being taught in their churches that they'd attended before or anything else. David Koresh could talk about the Bible and make you feel you understood better what God wanted. Didn't he tolerate argument too? to a certain extent. Charlie Manson would never let anybody argue with him. Jim Jones would never let anybody argue with him. David Koresh encouraged his followers. If I'm saying something that you don't understand or you think is wrong, 
and he would talk to them about it in front of the whole group. And what the survivors all said was, I thought I had a good argument. But I listened to him, and he convinced me. Uh, I would urge you, if you get a chance, listen to some of his sermons and teachings that are on tape. It, it would be worth the trouble. I mean, you might, you might think, oh my God, he's still a fraud. But you get a really good sense of, if people want to believe this, he's giving them a good reason to believe it. But if they, you know, if they did come to some kind of agreement or try to work stuff out, or try to understand where these fighters were coming from, do you think he would have given up his gun? Do you think he would have just gone back on, on what everything he was teaching? He wouldn't have gone back on what he was teaching. But Not think, at all. Do you think he would have got rid of it? No. <laughs> but I think what would have happened is if, let's say, the local county sheriff who knew Koresh and got along with him very well, and a couple of the ATF guys had simply driven up, you know, in a car, a knocked on the door and said, hey, David, we're worried about something. Can you come downtown and talk to us? Because they'd done that before. Koresh would have known they weren't just going to jump him and throw him in the right. slammer. Right. And that would have taken away the excuse by his followers that this must be the attack David told us was coming. They could, and that's why I get so frustrated and have been frustrated for years in writing this. A little common sense. Why not try that? If he wouldn't come, then you can send in all the troops. But they gave him the justification that he needed. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you have anybody like that with your book that helps to look them over and helps you shape them? I am one of the luckiest writers in America. To begin with, there's only about 200 writers who can make a living just from their books and don't need day jobs. I've been able to do that. And one reason I have is my editor at Simon & Schuster is a man named Bob Bender. Bob is a master editor. His lead writer would never be me because it was David McCullough. But even David McCullough says, if you have an editor that supports you, but is willing to push you a little farther, I know you've explained this, but I think you could do it a little better. I know this is fascinating, this whole sort of little detour you took mm -hmm. on this or that but it will break the narrative of your story. You need to remove it. And I'm fortunate that I've got an old-fashioned editor. When I'm done with a draft, we print it out, and he gets a pencil. Because mm -hmm. computers and me, you know, we're not real sim sympathetic to each other. Uh, he's wonderful. Without him, I don't think my books would be as good as they are, whether they're good or not, I guess. I'm not a judge. But he's amazing. He makes me a better writer, he makes my books better, and I'm always grateful to him. Yes, ma'am. To circle back on Curtis's question, why didn't they try to be a peaceful, like why did they just go in guns blazing? Well, they didn't go in with guns blazing to begin with. Uh, they went in with information they thought was correct and it was erroneous. They were told by the Branch Davidians who had left after Koresh started saying everybody's wife is mine and so forth, that all the illegal guns the Branch Davidians had were kept locked away in a room in an upper floor and only Koresh had the key and could get in. They thought that if they could take them by surprise and 76 agents were crammed into two cattle trailers to swing up the driveway, that they could get between the guns and the Branch Davidian men, and then they could simply take Koresh. What they didn't know, because all these informants had left at least a year earlier, was in the interim, Koresh had started training people in the use of the weapons, and all the Branch Davidians had guns and ammunition in their rooms. So there wasn't going to be this half hour, whatever it would take. There will always be controversy over who fired the first shots. ATF says there is no question it was a Branch Davidians. Branch Davidians say there was no question ATF. 
Uh, there were journalists from the Waco newspaper who'd gotten tipped this was going to happen. And when everything happened, they were in a ditch right across the road from Mount Carmel. I have interviewed them. They are all definite. The first shots came from within Mount Carmel coming out. Uh, the other thing, when people say, well, what do you think happened? Well, I think everybody remembers a gunfight in different ways, and you, you can't really keep it all straight. You're talking about 76 trained professional lawmen who had deliberately scaled down the guns that they had, and in fact were told, we don't want anybody getting hurt because we're filming this. And you have inside a group of about 90 adults who believe that this is the prophecy finally happening where well, there must be a gun battle. They've got automatic weapons that you just pull the trigger back and the bullets start to spew. And I have to ask myself, who is more likely to panic and pull the trigger before it's necessary? We'll never know. And in the book, I do not offer an opinion because that's not my job. I tell you what each side said. As a person who's talked to everybody pretty much involved, and the journalists, what they recount matters to me. I think probably someone among the Branch Davidians pulled the trigger prematurely. ATF certainly would have to respond to that. That's their training. And once a couple shots were fired, in a way it doesn't matter who fired the first ones, everybody was going down with guns blazing. How about the helicopters? Second controversy. Uh, ATF had some helicopters they were going to use to try to distract the Branch Davidians while the, truck, the cattle trucks came in. And, uh, I have actually studied transcripts. These were National Guard helicopters. None of the National Guard helicopters had mounted guns. Uh, there, were a couple, there were six ATF agents spread among them, but these agents only had handguns in their holsters. They swear, and the pilots who were National Guard, they have no reason to lie on ATF's behalf, that no shots were ever fired from the helicopters. We do know that two of the three helicopters were damaged with heavy gunfire while they were still a couple hundred yards away from Mount Carmel. And that absolutely is the case, and they had to go down in a field nearby. But the Branch Davidians remember that a helicopter swooped right down next to the building and just machine gunning straight in and that two of the five Branch Davidians killed in that first attack were killed from fi fire up above. We could have known the absolute facts because if you went, you know, looked at the roof of Mount Carmel and there were a bunch of bullet holes in it, you know, experts could have told us, did the bullets come down from above or were they being fired up? problem with that being uh, most of Mount Carmel burned to the ground and the FBI claims to try to make it safe on the grounds afterwards, they knock down the rest of the standing buildings, which lends itself to conspiracy theory was the FBI trying to cover up. I tend to look at the testimony of the pilots, okay? They were, and there were no mounted guns. Uh, handguns, I'm not much of a marksman. Anybody here, uh, do you use, you know, you're familiar with guns? It's hard for me to believe at 200 yards with just handguns, yeah, in a helicopter that's moving, that there could have been sharpshooting and knocking down people. But I also think the Branch Davidians who survived, who certainly are still outraged at all this, in their minds, they see it happening. They're not lying. I just think, you know, they may be mistaken. Again, in the book, I give both sides. And that's all we can do, really. How, how efficient were, the, how, were the, the people you interviewed, did they want to be interviewed? Or did you have to hound some of them? Did they come to you? Did they... In every book like this, right. whether it's about Manson, Jim Jones, David Koresh, there are always a couple go-to people that everybody who's writing a story for a newspaper or a book will go to. Right. 
In this case, Byron Sage of the FBI was always the spokesman, and Clive Doyle, a surviving Branch Davidian, was always, and I talked to both of them. But I also went beyond that, trying to find people involved who had not ever been interviewed. Particularly, I wanted to talk to the agents of ATF who were in those cattle cars, and none of them had ever spoken on the record. Right, right. I found one of them who was reluctant at first. I asked him to read some of my books. You can see the kind of writer I am. And if you don't want to talk to me then, don't. But if you think there are things that have never come out that should have, I may not agree with you, but what you say, I will put in the book. And after he talked to me, suddenly I get a call from a couple other ATF agents. After someone who knew Kathy Schroeder had suggested I talk to her, suddenly there's a few more surviving Branch Davidians. And so over two or three years, you build that. You don't get everything at once. But yes, you will, if you read the book, you will be hearing first person testimony from people who were there and hadn't given it before. Mm -hmm. I, I don't write my books by, you know, getting on the internet. <laughs> and, and, and how reluctant or, or out there they were. Okay, Here, here's a journalistic trick, and this man knows it, and I'm sure does it better <laughs> than I do. Nobody wants to be interrogated. Come on. Now you know you guys had to fire for it. But everyone who has lived through something traumatic wants to explain. What I always will say is, can you help me understand what happened? And people want to talk. And when my books come out, I always send a copy to everyone I've interviewed for them. You know, if you have a problem, talk to me about it. If there's an error I've made that, you know, is, can be demonstrated, in the next edition, I'll take it out. I'm actually friends with some of the surviving members of People's Temple who survived Jonestown because they were such intelligent, socially conscious people that when they're not talking about Jonestown, they talk about a lot of social issues I find interesting. Wouldn't that be a great dinner party to have like the Manson folks, the Jonestown people? Well, uh, uh, the Manson folks. They're getting uh, a little old, long say, in the tooth and now. And let's say I'm, I'm not say it's comfortable discussing that because there wasn't any great social issue that they were trying to address. Right. Yeah. With some of the surviving Branch Davidians, I actually like them as human beings. I don't think I'm very popular with them anymore because of what you're going to read about Cyrus Teed in the book. Mm -hmm. But I had to write the facts as I found them. And I tried to give each of them a chance to talk to me about it before the book came out so they wouldn't get blindsided. Maybe we should wrap it up. I didn't realize how late we'd gone, but fascinating, <laughs> fascinating uh, discussion Listen, tonight. Listen, you folks are great. I, it's nice of you to come out and visit with us. You know, obviously, I'll sign books for any of you if you want, and then we're going to go. I'm going to go have dinner with this man, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to talk him into writing a book. And I promise you that there we go. if he will do it, I know they'll have him here. <laughs> and kidding? wherever I am, I will come in because I'm going to want to hear him talk about his book. There you no go, pressure, Robert. Buddy. You got to do it. Thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Thanks everybody here at the store. And uh, let's see, if you wouldn't mind just folding up your chair and putting it against the back wall there. Want to just stay here inside? Sure. Great. Take things off. Yeah. A lot of fun. Is that okay? It was great. Fantastic. Was I leading it too much? Hmm? Was I leading the thing no, too much? Not okay. at all. There's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And it helps to have someone. Yeah. You say, let's move on to the next one. That makes sense. Let's see.